temperate acts. How do we perform these acts in the first place? Well, here's what he says. He asks the question, or is this not true even of the arts? It's possible to do something that is in accordance with the laws of grammar, whether by chance or under the guidance of another. A man will be a grammarian then, only when he has both done something grammatical and done it grammatically. And this means doing it in accordance with the grammatical knowledge in himself. The distinction that Aristotle is drawing here is doing an act which happens to be in accordance with the rules and internalizing those rules and following them. So he can conclude, if acts that are in accordance with the virtues have themselves a certain character, it does not follow that they are done justly or temperately. So just because somebody is acting right, it doesn't mean they're doing it in the right way. The agent must also be in a certain condition when he does them. In the first place, he must have knowledge. Secondly, he must choose the acts and choose them for their own sakes. And thirdly, his action must proceed from a firm and unchangeable character. So the point Aristotle is making is a very straightforward one here. That is that it's one thing to perform the occasional just or unjust, for that matter, or brave or temperate act. It's another thing to have developed a character that makes these actions the kind that one spontaneously produces and in which one takes pleasure. So we might say then that you first perform just acts in an unjust way. Maybe you're being instructed by somebody, being told, hand back the book that you borrowed, or maybe you're being coerced, give it back now. And only when one has the virtue of justice do you perform these acts in a just way. This is the distinction between simply performing a virtuous act and being virtuous. But now we need to ask the question, what is a virtue? Well, Aristotle's got a lovely account. He says that a virtue is always a mean between two extreme vices. And the reason for this is that any kind of excellence can be ruined either by excess or by defect. We could have too much of a trait or too little of a trait. That's why Aristotle argues that it's so hard to become a good person because it's hard to precisely hit the mean. It's hard to find the center of a circle. And for different people, of course, that mean might also be different. Just for instance, as in eating, a professional athlete may need to eat a lot of food, whereas somebody on a diet very little. So achieving a virtue, Aristotle argues, is a kind of art that requires judgment and expertise. You remember he pointed that out in saying that a young person is not a person to study ethics. And so Aristotle offers a number of examples of virtues and the pairs of vices that correspond to them. We might say that courage is a mean between cowardice, having too little of the trait, and rashness, having too much. Being rash is no virtue. It's running into danger thoughtlessly. The courageous person faces danger thoughtfully and appropriately. Generosity is a mean between stinginess and profligacy. Dignity is a mean between self-deprecation and pomposity. It's a bad thing to think too little of yourself, a bad thing to think too much. Dignity is somewhere in between. Wittiness, a nice virtue to display at a dinner party, is a mean between boorishness and buffoonery. And we certainly know people who fail to hit that mean and land in each extreme. Friendliness, a mean between grouchiness and promiscuity. And honesty, a mean between dishonesty and tactlessness. So you're not being honest when somebody asks how does this dress look on me? And you say, it looks absolutely frightful. You look disgusting, even if that's the truth. That's just tactless. That's too much of a good thing. And so Aristotle concludes from this point that virtue is always this mean between extremes. Hence, it is no easy task to be good. For in everything, it's no easy task to find the middle. For example, to find the middle of a circle is not for everyone, but for him who knows. So too, can anyone get angry? That is easy or give or spend money. But to do this, to the right person, to the right extent, at the right time, with the right motive, and in the right way, that is not for everyone, nor is it easy. Wherefore, goodness is both rare and laudable and noble. This is a really lovely and deep point. If you want to know why it's so hard to find truly good people, the answer is because it involves this judicious ability to hit the mean. So much for virtue. As we said before, virtue needs to be supplanted with an account of activity in accordance with virtue, and activity requires choice, and choice requires wisdom. 
So virtue isn't anywhere near enough for happiness. Choice isn't just a wish. It's not that I perform an action just by wishing that I could. In order to choose an action, I need to deliberate. We might wish for our ends. I might wish to become wealthy. I might wish to become a great teacher. I might wish to be a better philosopher or to learn Serbo-Croatian. But I have to deliberate to choose actions. I have to deliberate to figure out how to make money, how to be a better teacher, or how to learn Serbo-Croatian. So wishing mobilizes virtue, but deliberation mobilizes practical wisdom, that is, phronesis. You might wonder, isn't practical wisdom just another virtue? Aristotle argues that it's not. He argues that it's not for two reasons. First, practical wisdom, or phronesis, is not a mean. That is, you can't have too much of it, the more the better. And that's not true of the traits that become virtues. And secondly, practical wisdom can serve vice as well. The thief may have good practical wisdom. He may know how to crack safes, how to pick your pocket. So uh, practical wisdom is an independent dimension from virtue and vice. It's not sufficient to have practical wisdom in order to be happy, but it is necessary because if you only have virtue and don't know how to choose actions, then you'll be, unfortunately, the person who's good at heart but who screws her life up um, in all kinds of ways. Practical wisdom keeps you from messing up, as it were. But As we said in our very first lecture on Aristotle, just having virtue and practical wisdom isn't enough either. There's a third dimension, and that's the dimension of moral strength. Because it's possible to want to do what's right and to work out using your practical wisdom exactly what the right thing is and to fail to do it because of temptation or because of an inability to face pain. We call this moral weakness. Um, But it's also, of course, possible, and we know people like this, to stick to one's resolve even if it's difficult. That's what we call moral strength. Moral strength is not a matter um, of having virtue, and moral weakness is not a matter of a lack of virtue. It's instead a lack of fortitude. We can see that moral strength isn't a virtue because there's no mean here, again, just like practical wisdom. You can't have too much of this trait. The more moral strength you have, the better. The other reason is it could be related to vice as well. You could decide to do something really horrible, to commit a murder, to rob a bank. And you might be tempted not to do it. It might be scary. But you call up your moral strength and you stick to your resolve. So moral strength isn't necessarily in the service of the good. So like practical wisdom, it could serve vice or virtue. It's a separate dimension. Moreover, Unlike virtue and practical wisdom, moral strength doesn't seem to involve knowledge. Virtue requires us to know what to do. Practical wisdom requires us to know how to do it. But we could have all of that knowledge and still fail to act. And what shows that is the idea of regret. People who are morally weak, even though they don't act virtuously, regret acting viciously. They feel bad. They know what they should have done. They know that they failed. And that also shows that moral weakness is different from vice. Because people who are vicious rejoice in their vice. They know what they did. They chose it freely. They did it, and they're pleased. We might be repelled by it, but they think it's okay. But the morally weak person knows that she did wrong. And so regret is a good sign that we're dealing with virtue plus moral weakness when we see a vicious act, not vice. Since action requires virtue, practical wisdom, and moral strength. And since happiness, as we've seen, is activity in accordance with virtue, that is, eudaimonia is activity in accordance with virtue, all three of these, virtue and these two conditions on the action side, practical wisdom and moral strength, are all necessary for the happy life. None of them is individually sufficient. That's good. This covers the internal side of the good life, the sort of aspect of character. We've got virtue, we choose the right ends, we have the right habits, we make the right choices, and we take pleasure in that. We've got practical wisdom, we know how to deliberate and choose actions appropriate to our ends, and we've got moral strength, that is the resolve to stick to those choices. We're halfway there. But we still need the external goods that make eudaimonia, that make flourishing proper. Uh, possible. There are two classes of these goods that Aristotle discusses. 
The first are what we might call material goods. You need to have enough wealth to be generous. You need to have good health in order to 